All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Emily McGraw and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. During today's presentation, attendees will be in listen-only mode. If you experience technical problems, please use the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel as we'll be monitoring that area, especially during the start of the presentation. You may also use the questions pane at any time during today's presentation to ask questions you may have during the talk. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. So we're pleased to have Dr. Leslie Ann dupini Giro with us today. Dr. Leslie Ann dupini Giro is a professor of climatology in the Department of Geography at the University of Vermont. She uses a variety of mixed methods from remotely sensed data to statistics and historical content analysis to explore the influence of atmospheric processes on fluvial processes in vegetated landscapes. She specializes in climate hazards and severe weather with a special focus on flooding and drought. As a state climatologist for Vermont, she engages directly with community groups, federal and state agencies, and national climate organizations. She is the lead editor of Historical Climate Variability and Impacts in North America, the first monograph to deal with the use of documentary and other ancillary records for analyzing climate variability and change. Dr. Dupini Giro awards and grants include the 2018 Association for Women Geoscientists Professional Excellence Award in the Academia Research Category, the NSF funded Satellites Weather and Climate Professional Development Program for in service K 12 science and mathematics teachers, and the NSF funded Diversity Climate Network to enhance diversity in climatology. Nationally, she is the lead author for the Northeast chapter of the fourth National Climate Assessment of the U.S. Global Climate Research Climate Change Research Program. She also serves on the NOAA Science Advisory Board Climate Working Group, helping to guide climate research across the U.S. In 2014, she was a scholar in residence for the Sustainability Graduate Institute at Goddard College and their commencement speaker in spring 2015. In 2015, Dr. Du Dr. Dupini Giroux was elected a fellow of the Vermont Academy of Science and Engineering in recognition of her academic and outreach contributions to the state. So Leslie Ann, whenever you're ready. Thanks a lot, Emily, and thanks to both you and Marina for the invitation. But uh, talk a little bit about um, the fourth national climate assessment and to give you maybe a, a high level overview of some of the things about the process itself. And I'd like to end with um, actually doing a walkthrough of the, um, the, the website because that's one of the things I know is, is of particular interest in here. So thanks everyone for being online right now. And um, one of the things that I will just jump straight on in is to, to look at parts of the um, process here. And, and my slide seems to have stuck. There we go. Okay, so what, what the, the fourth national climate assessment, um, one of the things that's a little bit different from the third national climate assessment, which came out in 2014, is that we, we sort of realized that there, there needed to be um, a, a better speaking to our, our local stakeholders because that's the level at which a lot of decision making was, was being taking, was taking place. And some of the information um, was a little bit of a mismatch in terms of the way that it was either presented or the focus or so on, so on and so forth. So one of the big differences with the fourth national climate assessment is that it, it separated out the physical science piece, which appeared in one um, volume or one report, and that's called the, the climate science special report report that came out um, in 2017, and that's called Volume 1. And then the second report, which is called Volume 2, which you see at the top of the screen here, is more related to, to looking at what are the, um, the impacts, risks, and the, the challenges to adaptation and mitigation across the U.S. and, and U.S. affiliated territories and, and islands. And so that, that second piece came out on, I, I think we now call it Climate Friday, the, the Friday after Thanksgiving um, last November 2018. So in, in looking at, at this volume two, where the focus is a little bit different, I'll, I'll show you some of the questions that we were asked specifically as authors to address. Um, it, it's important to, to realize that as we're going through and coming up with the assessment 
of the science that has taken place since 2014. The goal of this is to be relevant to the, the different levels at which policies are being made, but not to be overly prescriptive in terms of saying you must do this and you should be doing that. So that's one of the, the key things I always point out whenever I'm asked to give either a presentation or responding to que uh, questions and queries from the media. Now, the other thing that sort of came out from the third national climate assessment was there needed to be a little bit more emphasis on the individual regions across the U.S., uh, the Caribbean, Hawaii, and affiliated islands. And so what you'll, you'll notice in this new um, fourth assessment, especially in volume two, is that they've expanded the, the range, the scope, and the actual um, amount of content that is devoted to the regions while shrinking the, the emphasis on the, the national pieces. And so the idea was to have the, the, the regional information sort of be the core of the report and then have that sort of bubble up and get summarized into the national pieces. So what that physically means is that the national chapters are about six pages long and the regional chapters are about 20 pages long or so. And so in, in looking through and, and working through some of those pieces, um, additional elements that are brand new in this, this fourth assessment are the fact that we now have um, a chapter that is entirely devoted to the U.S. Caribbean. Formerly it had been um, uh, affiliated with the, the southeast part of, of the U.S., so we now have a brand new chapter on the Caribbean. The other big piece that, that sort of came out of feedback from the last process was that having the, the Great Plains region pretty much run from the border with Canada all the way down to the Gulf um, encompassed a little bit too much in terms of content, in terms of the, the regionality and the specificity with which um, responses were being made. And so another element of this fourth assessment is breaking out the Northern Great Plains with the Southern Great Plains. And so what that allows you to do is to actually sort of drill down deeper into um, what's taking place at very specific um, subsections across regions. It allows you to do more detailed case studies of various elements of change, be it from a physical perspective, but also from a human perspective. And speaking of that and speaking of, of how um, some of that preparation went in for NCA4, I'm gonna point out to you right at the bottom of this slide here, one of the inputs that was um, a key preparatory piece with the state summaries that were prepared, and I'll show you that when we get to the website level. But each state had a summary that very much mimics the format, the content, the, the presentation of the NCA4 report in looking at changes over time on a state level. And so that helps us, again, drill down even deeper than just um, having to rely on, on the regional perspective. So state summaries that NCI cs.org and we'll, we'll take a look at that in a few minutes. So thinking about what we needed to, to sort of um, address from the lessons learned from the feedback in NCA3, one of the things that we, we, we saw in NCA4 apart from the state summaries were some of the other products that were developed to support the entire process. Um, one of the important ones, and this sort of came up in, in the question and answer period at the um, AGU back in December was, where does economics fit into all of this? How do we sort of weave that into the narrative? How do we weave that into the understanding of uh, a change in climate and how it affects the various economies and livelihoods across the various regions of the US? And so um, we, we have these new economic valuation studies that were specifically created to, to help address that. And so um, this slide and the next slide show you a couple of these examples of the, the types of, of, of studies that were created um, to look at impacts of things like changes in number of hours that are worked and how things like um, ground level ozone could affect um, your, your, your labor quality and so forth. All of, of them uh, specifically referencing back to the, the two representative concentration pathways or RCPs that um, are the bounding boxes of everything that we did in the report. So the upper level RCP 8.5 and then the lower level which is RCP 4.5. So as you go through the report you'll see that those two representative concentration pathways were used as the, the outer limits of, of when we think about um, 
what we could be striving for, and then pretty much the path that we've been on um, for the last uh, few years or so. So another piece of what the, uh, the economic uh, valuation studies might look like takes you not just from that um, national level, but it allows you to sort of drill down to more of a, a regional and a city-specific level. So here's a, a quick example of looking at um, the, the effect of uh, threshold sort of ratios, which is what you see on the left-hand side here, annual number of days above 100 degrees as, as a threshold, and again with the two um, upper and, and lower scenarios that we were charged with looking at relative to the observed period. And then how does that sort of play out from a response perspective. So on the right-hand side here, you're looking at hydration stations and, and cooling um, refuges across the, um, the, the city of, of Phoenix itself as a very, very specific case study example of how, uh, um, how projected changes in those hot days could look like by uh, 2100. So two other additional pieces in terms of the actual products that were developed were uh, climate change indicators, and that specific piece was spearheaded by the EPA, and so they pulled together, again, a number of different physical and other landscape, uh, as well as human-based indicators that allowed us to, to sort of drill down and look at some of the pieces of how do you know that things are changing and what do the trends actually look like? And then the third piece in terms of some of those products that were developed were um, downscaled information. And again, a lot of that threshold types of um, evaluations that you, you saw on this previous slide here were actually part of this, this brand new locally downscaled suite of products that were made available to us. And they're actually available to everybody because, as you know, all of the products that um, are generated for the NCA floor are publicly available. So those are some of the products that are brand new for, for the new um, fourth assessment. The other piece that was brand new is how did we um, get instructed to actually write up each of these regional, regional chapters? Because if they're now the core of the report, what is it that's different uh, in looking at how climate change has played out across each region? And so um, we were, were challenged and invited to kind of think about what is unique about each region and then sort of speak to that to look at, at, at how changes in each of those unique features are either occurring and or how bad could they get and or what do we need to actually still address in there. So um, forgive me for doing this, but I'm going to show you the, the Northeast as an example of how do we play out those unique features. So when you think about the Northeast, and we, we think about what is it that makes the Northeast different from other parts of the U.S. We have that very, very striking um, dynamic between having some of the largest cities in the U.S., but also having some of the, the most um, rural areas in, in the U.S. as well. And so that dynamic, that dichotomy between rural and urban played out really, really strongly. And that's one of the reasons why some of the, the key messages in the Northeast chapter were specifically designed to, to pull that out. As you look at that map of the Northeast on, on the, the right-hand side of the slide, you'll also see that there's a very strong um, coastal versus inland dynamic. And again, that played out in, in looking at how things like um, changes in your coastal ecosystems, ecosystem services would be different from some of the challenges that we face inland. Um, the Northeast is one of the longest settled parts of the U.S., and so that has implications for things like urban infrastructure, um, sea level rise, and when sea level rise meets uh, infrastructure that's at least 200 years old, the, the, the implications, again, are going to be very different than a place that may have been settled for a shorter period of time. Uh, the Appalachians, which make their way up through the Northeast into uh, the Green Mountains, the White Mountains uh, into the Maine, the, the physical geography and topography of the region again sets up dynamics that are, are played out a little bit differently than places that may be a, a bit flatter in terms of their, their physical geography. And then the cultural heritage of the region is, is critically important when we think about um, our, our indigenous peoples of the region. We think about some of the large cultural centers. We think about some of them being um, on coast, sometimes in some cases 
this is a few feet above sea level, and how that becomes important when we think about uh, a changing climate. So this fourth National Climate Assessment, Volume 2, has us thinking about what's called a risk-based frame to, to, the, to the, the approach to, to understanding uh, climate change. And so when we think about a risk-based frame, we're, we're thinking about um, what or who is at risk, uh, what is the value in a particular region, um, what should be done without being, again, policy prescriptive, what would happen if nothing was done, and, and when we, we think about it from both an adaptive perspective as well as a mitigative perspective. And then are there tipping points that um, could occur? Are there tipping points that have occurred? And what are some of these important thresholds, again, from a physical perspective, but also from a human perspective across each region? So all of us were, were, were challenged to use these questions that you see, the four questions with these check marks on here, to, to keep them front and center as we were going back through all of the research that had been done since at least the about 2013 to the present that do speak to, to, to these risks that we're looking at here. So to help us answer some of those questions, one of the first things that we did was to have what are called regional engagement workshops for REWSs across um, the entire suite of where we needed to look at. And as you're, as you're looking at this map here, you, you see two sizes of, of circles, the largest circle are what we call the, the hubs, and that's where most of the authors, uh, most of the team would have gathered. And then the spokes, which are the smaller uh, circles, would have been satellite locations where folks would have gathered um, in, in a, uh, an institute or a state climatology office or some other venue like that and spend some time interacting with each other so that we can actually address some of those questions. And a lot of the, the materials that came out of, of these REWs were directly related to the, the key messages that we came up with across the, the various chapters. So um, a shout out to, to all of the, the folks who were key and instrumental in, in helping to, to get that information from as many different parts and corners of our various regions as possible. So, when, when all of the chapters were created and we, we all came up with our key messages, the, the national office went through and sort of pulled out uh, some of the key elements of, of each region. And I really like this, um, this, 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 this diagram that comes from the overview chapter of the, of the assessment itself. And it, it sort of pulls out um, the, the impact and some of the various um, actions, be they adaptive or mitigative, across each of these regions. And because it's so nice and spatial, you get a sense of where things are happening, what the various challenges are, and how illustrative these case studies can actually be. So again, this is from the overview chapter of, of Volume 2. So I had to give a, a similar presentation to this at the AMS meeting about a month ago, and what I did for that is I actually went through and read all of the key messages from our, our 10 regions and pulled out uh, the themes that, that kept um, coming up. And it was really, really surprising and gratifying to see that even though we're different, we're all the same because we, we all talk about ecosystem, ecosystem services. We all had an, an adaptation, an adaptive capacity piece in there. Indigenous peoples, and their, their livelihoods and their challenges were all critically important to every one of our 10 regions. There were elements of human health, whether it is vector-borne disease, waterborne disease, air quality challenges, all of those were critical to us. And most, most of our, our regions had a, a coast, and so there, there were a number of these marine and coastal challenges that came into play that were separate from sea level rise. And then looking at our agricultural productivity, looking at the ways in which um, a changing climate affects infrastructure, be they buildings, but also our, our transportation infrastructure, all critically important. So these are some of the overarching themes that sort of ran through and were pervasive across the, the report itself. So thinking about those, those overarching themes and looking at the ways in which um, we have varying uh, degrees of, of response to them. Uh, how do we continue to, to make both 
um, adaptation and mitigation um, measures that will allow us to continue to reduce the, the various risks that we have identified to our changing climate. And again, some of these bullet points are already in canned presentation, so I know that's one of the, the things that um, folks on, on, on the call are probably going to be looking for. How do I access some of these resources? If some of these presentation slides are already available, how can I just pull that in and, and make them maybe a little bit more specific to, to my region? So again, this is from the overview chapter of, of the, the volume two. So speaking of, 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 of measures, uh, there are two chapters in, in the uh, volume two report. One of them was devoted to looking at mitigation activities um, by state. And the other one was devoted to looking at adaptation. So chapter 29 in the report is a mitigation chapter. And, and I know I'm a geographer, so I love anything that's geospatial and math-based, but this is a really um, important way of, of addressing the, um, the dichotomy between where there's a lot of mitigation activities taking place and where there's not so much mitigation taking place and allowing you to sort of tease out by sector, which is what the, the bottom part of this diagram is, there's a color coding going on here, tease out by sector what a lot of the, the, um, the, the progress is being made across the various parts of the U.S. So adaptation is the corollary to that. Adaptation is chapter 28. And this diagram here is one of my favorites because uh, a number of different reasons. One is that it sort of takes you through the cycle, pretty much like um, the drought planning cycle that I know some of you are familiar with. So from awareness all the way through to planning and, and implementation and so forth, that's, that's one part of it. But the other part that I really like about this particular figure is that um, you've got NCA3, which is what came out in 2014, and we were just at the cusp of getting a lot of, of um, strategies and measures in place. And then in 2018, it's really uh, gratifying to be able to report on a lot of these. So we've now moved into the implementation phase in here. So chapter 28 allows us to sort of delve into the, some of those pieces and, and look at, at how that's kind of playing out. Um, because adaptation is so important and because pretty much every chapter has uh, an element in here that is devoted to adaptation, um, I just wanted to, to, to point out the adaptation key message for the Northeast, which is, is what you see across in here. So we're looking at the ways in which um, implementation um, and using different types of support, this decision support tools have allowed us to, to make some strides in continuing to address um, the challenges of climate change across our, our region. Uh, chapter 15, which is the uh, Tribes and Indigenous Peoples chapter, um, has a lot of wonderful examples of, of adaptation um, success stories. So we have one from Ile de Jean Charles in Louisiana and the, and the ways in which the, the community there has been able to use federal funding to, to respond to sea level rise and, and coastal flooding. Also in that chapter, chapter 15, there's another example and this one comes from Alaska and, and the ways in which um, this particular village Kivalina has been able to respond to, to the challenges of, 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 of changing sea level rise in that particular region as well. So thinking about um, what have I learned, because I, I, was, I was able and fortunate privilege to be part of both NCA3 as well as NCA4, um, what are some of the things that we've learned both from a process perspective but also from an outcome perspective? So if we take process first of all, um, it really became clear that a lot of the, the success of, of writing up this particular assessment was due to um, having networks in place, having them in place before the assessment started, having them in place throughout the assessment, making sure that everybody who needed to be at the table was there, making it a highly inclusive process. Um, having those connections that, that are, are sort of multi-scale, multi-level from the, the town level all the way up through to the national level. And one quick example of, of how all this kind of plays out 
was an example that um, Victoria Kena showed when she did her presentation at AGU. Uh, so the report hit on Climate Friday, and by the Monday after Thanksgiving, the mayor of Hawaii was giving a, a press conference highlighting the, 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 the importance of national climate assessment and, and using that as a springboard to, to continue some of the excellent work that is taking place um, across uh, the Hawaiian islands. So that's a, a, an awesome example of that. Um, networking with our indigenous peoples and tribes also is a, a long-term and sustained process. And um, continuing to do that as we prepare for NCA 5 is also going to be critically important as we move forward. Now, there was a question that came up. Um, where are the gaps? What are we missing? How do we need to address that? How do you know that you have a high confidence? Or how do you know that you've gotten everything? And so the answer to that question is what we call traceable accounts. And traceable accounts are a start to finish sort of tracking of every single thing, every single part of the process from everything like a contact that was made, a phone call that came in, but also every single paper that you read, every single paper that you included in the report itself, how do you justify all of that? How do you use that to say that things are likely to occur? Um, this is where we still need to have information addressed, and so this is where your research gaps are actually included. And so when I gave this presentation to the, the, the um, federal partners in New England, they, 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 they were very quick to, to ask me, what do we need to do? How can we, as a network, already start to contribute? And so traceable accounts is going to be one of those places that uh, I'd love to follow up with them to actually tease out our, our ongoing gaps that we could start to address, again, in preparation for the fifth national climate assessment. So. The second thing in terms of, of lessons learned were what are the, the outcomes? And um, talking to, let's say, climatologists, colleagues, talking to other folks who have been part of this process and knowing who our variants, various audiences are, knowing who, who has used the report, who's going to use the report, the types of material that are important, where are some of these things going to end up, whether it's the peer-reviewed literature or whether it's face-to-face um, -face information or in individual um, conversations or presentations that might be given. Um, those are some of the things that sort of keep in mind in, in how the material is written up, how the graphics are presented. So speaking about graphics, um, data visualization is absolutely key. And Knowing, knowing how these graphics are going to be used or have been used in the past is one of the pieces that I, I know as lead author I was particularly sensitive to because up until about two or three weeks ago, I still got a, 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 a question from somebody who asked me about uh, a map that had appeared in the second climate assessment that showed you know, our region sort of becoming more like uh, Virginia in X year and then more like Atlanta in Y year. And that visual has just sort of um, stuck with, with, with that individual for at least 15 years. And so knowing how your graphics are going to be used, critically important. So um, one graphic that we created for the Northeast was trying to explain the influence of, of sea level rise and coastal inundation and what that might have um, as an implication for our, our physical landscape but also for infrastructure as well. So two examples that I, I absolutely um, love, one comes from the uh, chapter on Hawaii and U.S. affiliated islands, so that's chapter 27. And then second one comes from the Pacific Northwest, which is chapter 24. So the, the chapter from Hawaii and Pacific um, islands, when you look at it, um, it's the same graphic, okay? but what is different is the upper one shows you the various indicators that were used to look at how climate is changing across the region in here. And the lower diagram shows you what the impacts are. I thought it was absolutely brilliant in, in using that, that visual structure to then um, convey that in, info, infographic information in that particular sense. Very different is the one from the, the Pacific Northwest. 
And what they did is they have a, a, a really, really clever diagram that has all of their key messages. So there are five key messages on here in a, a circle so that your eye follows that circle. And then you've got the impacts on the inside in here in terms of some of the case studies of what occurred in one particular year of 2015. So again, visualizations and how those can help us to, 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 to sell that message of what we're trying to, to create in, in words. So the last thing that um, I wanted to talk a little bit about before I switch gears and went to the uh, website is this is an ongoing process. It has been an ongoing process. And part of the, the, the way in which it gets supported is by access to some of these larger resources like the Climate Resilience Toolkit, which is a, an amazing uh, repository of not only things like case studies, which you know, a lot of us drew from in writing up the, the uh, report, but it also has um, some, some amazing tools that allow you to actually perform your, your own analysis of what climate change has looked like and, and could look like because they're both projections in there as well as observed um, information. And so on the right hand side, you'll see um, examples of some of the uh, sectors that are addressed in there, some of the types of tools, and then some of the types of, of strategies. So um, here's the today's screenshot of the climate resilience toolkit. And again, part of it um, takes you out to the Climate Explorer, which is where you can get a lot of the, the climate uh, modeling information in here, and, and really use this to, to delve into some of the things that, that we as authors of the fourth assessment use to help us um, prepare. So here's my contact information. Uh, please feel free to, to, to drop me a line, uh, give me a call. There's the, um, the fourth national climate assessment website. I'll leave that up for a little bit just in case anybody wants to do a screenshot. And then I'll transition to the um, the website to give you a, a little bit of a walkthrough. Emily, should I pause for a second and, and see if there are any questions based on any of the material or should I just leave those at the end? Uh, we can wait till the end, but just a reminder to everyone, if you have questions at any point, you can use um, the GoToWebinar control panel, and we will get to those at the end. So you're welcome to keep going, Leslie Ann. Perfect. Thanks, Emily. All right. So switching gears here. So the, the website you had from that previous slide in here, and there are four or five elements of the, the, the website that I'm going to sort of walk you through on here. Um, most of this is, is going to be replicated across everything else that I point out, but I just wanted to, to kind of, of highlight a number of these drop-down boxes so that you can jump straight to you know, things like if you were interested in the credits versus how to use the report. You can also drop down to the various chapters. So if you had a particular chapter that you wanted to follow up on, you didn't need to either scroll through the entire report or download the entire report. So the national chapters appear first. The overview chapter that I mentioned also appears up here. And then we have the 10 regional chapters in here, followed by, because this is a very transparent process where you've got all of the different things that went into the, the entire process, those are sort of listed down here in the responses and the appendices. So the last scroll along on here is the downloads, which is perhaps um, the, one of the more important pieces in here. So again, you can either download everything that you wanted um, as the entire report, or you can break this up across in here. So let's take a look at uh, some of these um, by, by section here. So if, if I click on the downloads, and I've already opened this up so that we can actually see what it looks like, in the, the download section, what you are able to do is to select what you want us to be pulling down, either in PDF format, or if you wanted every single figure in the report, you could also do that. Similarly, every single bibliographic reference is in here. Um, 
If you wanted to do things by chapter, again, you have that option to sort of uh, scroll down and find a chapter of interest. And again, you can either take the entire chapter, you can do the two-page executive summary, you can grab all of the figures, or you can grab all of the presentation slides. So a lot of the presentation slides that, that I just used came from either the overview chapter or from individual chapters like the um, Northeast, for example, those chapters that I talked about, and so on. So all of those are available. So if you needed to do a presentation, um, all of this is available to, to, to you. So you know, if you clicked on any one of these, you know, you you'd get the usual box to sort of um, download and save that. So each one of these um, chapters in here looks something like this. There's a, a, an image that has been um, very um, thoughtfully chosen to represent the region. And as you're scrolling down through, you have your key messages. So if there are four or five of them, you can sort of scroll through and read each of those key messages so that you get the, the highlights of what you're going to be reading in the chapter. Here's access to your um, two-page executive summary. Okay. So that will allow you to sort of get, again, a little bit more of what you're going to be reading in the next part of that. If you were interested in, in knowing who had contributed, again, you've got a drop-down box that shows you all of those in here, as well as folks who served as technical contributors and, and, and either assisted with maps, case studies, and so forth. And then if you wanted to know what the citation was for a particular chapter or the entire report, you also had that as well. Okay. so. As you scroll through, um, you will see the chapter as it's laid out online. You can also download a PDF of this so that if you prefer to, to have something that is, is printable, that's also um, part of what you are able to do across it here. I had mentioned that there were state climate summaries that were created in support of this. And so this is the state climate, state climate summary page. And again, if you click on any one of these, one of the things that you'll notice is that it looks very, very similar to the National Climate Assessment. And that's because um, the technical support unit at KICS um, in Asheville were the ones who created this. And so you've got that very sort of nice continuous feel across the region. So again, with your scrolling key messages and so forth. And again, the layout of it is also very, very similar in terms of um, the presentation of the material, the ability to download these as PNGs and so forth. And the nice thing about each of these chapters is that there's always gonna be one iconic uh, case study that is specific to that particular state. Okay. So I think those are some of the, the, the highlights and the elements of the website that I wanted to, to sort of um, walk folks through. And I'd be more than happy to open it up for, for questions. I want to make sure I left enough time to, to respond to questions, to show um, additional things online or as the case may be. So Emily, I'm going to turn it back over to you. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Leslie. And I thought it's a great overview to give us an idea of some things that have changed and um, tools that are available to us in the field. Um, so a reminder, at this time, we'll take questions. So please use the question pane of the GoToWebinar control panel, and I'll read them um, individually um, so Leslie Ann can answer them. So we'll give people a few seconds. I do see, um, looks like somebody's hands raised but I don't see a question through the pane. So like a reminder, use that question pane um, and type out your question. I'll read it. Um, one of the things I found interesting um, was the graphic about showing the cities and states um, with their mitigation activities. So how did they 
kind of classify those, those mitigation activities or like for inclusion? You're talking about, uh, let's see, this one here? Uh, I don't know to do. This one? Yeah, yep. Okay, so that's the, the mitigation chapter, the national level chapter, and they they were charged with, with collecting information on, on all of these various sectors, and then I'm not sure the exact process that they used to, to do the highlighting, but they, they tried to, to at least address as many different types of, of mitigation activities as were available in the written record, and I think what I forgot to mention, I'm glad you raised this point, Emily, is that because this is an assessment and because we were charged with looking back through time, um, most of the, the the information that we were charged with looking at were peer-reviewed sources. And if peer-reviewed sources were not available, we would, would then charge with looking at um, agency reports. And those were, were some of the places where some of these um, mitigation um, might have come from going through those agency level reports if there was not a, a state level report or a region wide level report. Okay, excellent. Um, still not seeing any questions in the questions, Sam, so you must have done a really good job, but we'll give it another couple minutes, so please, um, any questions in the questions pane. Um, so kind of while we're waiting to see if we get any um, questions coming in, do you have any suggestions for us in the field um, to help how to get the word out or partner with some of the authors to help um, gather some of this information in the future? How to get the word out and gather information. So how to get the word out, um, I think uh, focal points are in a, a key place and space to do that because of, of what their job entails. And, and that's one of the reasons why I highlighted the presentation material so that they have ready access to, to pulling that in when they go to do the various types of outreach that I know they do, whether it is to the media or emergency management or state agencies, um, um, school groups, whoever it is that they're interacting with and doing outreach to, I wanted to make sure that they had those resources available to them. Um, in terms of, of helping to prepare for the future, I don't know if there's a, a region-wide um, focal point uh, group or listserv. There, there may be because I know uh, when I talk to, 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 to my uh, forecast office here in Burlington, there is uh, coordination across things like warnings and thresholds for warnings. So I don't know if something similar exists region-wide across the information that is shared among focal points, but that might be another way of starting to, to build that network so that when we we get ready for NCA five, which by the way you know probably started on on the first of January, um, we have a, another network to sort of tap into to draw that information from. All right, excellent. Well, not seeing any questions, so I um, suppose we will start wrapping up. I do have a um, recording, so I will send a recording out. Um, and then I can also send Leslie Ann's uh, contact information within that email with the recording in case you have any additional questions for her. So again, thank you, Leslie Ann, for your presentation and thanks everyone for attending and participating in today's presentation. So like I mentioned, I'll um, get this recording and some notes out in a few days, if not today. Um, so thanks again for your participation and this concludes the webinar. Thanks, Emily. Have a good day, everybody.